Greetings and welcome to the First Virginia Avenue Missionary Baptist Church Midweek Bible Study. We're delighted you've joined us here in the sanctuary as well as those individuals virtually that will be attending our Bible study and worship period. Uh, on behalf of Pastor Charles Henry Duncan Sr., we welcome you to our midweek Bible study. Trust that you'll be blessed as a result of the songs, prayer, scripture, and the exegesis of the Sunday school lesson that is scheduled for this coming Sunday. So relax and enjoy as we present uh, our services this evening, beginning with a um, selection of a song from the praise team under the direction of our music director, Brother Lewis Lipscomb, followed by prayer and scripture from our deacons, and another selection by the praise team, and then we'll come back and with the discussion for our Sunday school lesson out of uh, the book of Ezekiel, chapter 37. So, Thank you for joining us and worship well. God bless. listening audience, those that are watching by way of YouTube or Facebook, and to the children of God. Our scripture will be coming from a very familiar passage of scripture found in Philippians chapter 4, beginning at verse 8, and it reads, Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, Whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are 
of good report, if there be any virtue, and if there be any praise, think on these things, those things which ye have both learned and received and heard and seen in me, do, and the God of peace shall be with you. I read Philippians chapter 4, verses 8 through 9. May the Lord add a blessing to the readers, hearers, and doers of his word. Amen. Let us bow. Eternal God, our Father, it's again that we come into your presence. We come, first of all, Lord, acknowledging that we are sinners saved by grace. We are thankful, dear Heavenly Father, that you continue to look beyond our faults and supply our needs. Most of all, Lord, we thank you for starting us out first on a new day's journey. We thank you, dear Heavenly Father, that you clothed us in our right mind and you kept us throughout the day thus far. We know, dear Heavenly Father, there's so many people that woke up this morning that right now at this very hour is not with us. And Lord, I pray that your hand of mercy continue to be over your people. Lord, as we come into your presence, Lord, we just want to thank you for all the wonderful things that you do for us. Lord, sometimes we take it for granted just how good you really are. We thank at times, Lord, that you are supposed to do what you do because you are God. But oftentimes, Lord, we let you down on things that we are supposed to do. So I pray, dear Heavenly Father, that you would just give us a change of heart, give us a renewed mind. And I pray that you would stir up the gift that you placed in us, that we will do that which is pleasing in your sight. Lord, we thank you for this service. We thank you for our pastor. We thank you for the ones that are listening. And then I pray, dear Heavenly Father, if someone is wrestling with making a decision on what to do with their life, I suggest that you turn it over to Jesus. Lord, he can work things out better than any man that walks the face of this earth. Lord, we know, dear Heavenly Father, there's so many people that still don't believe that there is a God, but they still running rapid as the devil. Lord, give them a change of heart as well. And then I pray for this country. You know what's going on in this world. And Lord, we know that in your own given time, you're going to right the wrong. So allow us to continue to be that beacon of light, that ray of hope that you have called us out to be, that we will go out and we will shine in this dark world. Father, forgive us for our many sins. Help us to be obedient. Help us to do your will and do it your way. For it's in Jesus' name we do pray. Amen.
again and it's time for our Bible study. Our lesson tonight or for a midweek study this week comes to us from the book of Ezekiel. Ezekiel chapter 27, the latter part of that chapter. And the title for our study subject this coming Sunday is God's Servant King. We will be looking at the verses from Ezekiel 37, verse 21 through 28. This particular chapter begins, as many of you are familiar with it, uh, concerning the valley of the dry bones. And I remember as a little boy, I used to hear ministers preach about these bones in the valley and how they get together and they used to make a, quite a dramatic presentation in their message as they join the bones from the foot to the ankle and the leg and the thigh and the back and the chest and up to the shoulders and the arms and, and I guess they had to include the head to carry the brain. But anyway, this particular thing is, has to do with the message where Jesus or God our Father is making the presentation to the prophet Ezekiel to indicate to the people, the children of Israel, the fact that he has not forgotten them, and that he is going to rescue them in spite of and in the midst of their disobedience and the problems that occur in their life. What happens in, in this particular presentation in Ezekiel, the story is that the northern tribe, which was called Israel, which was the 10 tribes of the 12 tribes of Israel, and then the southern tribe was made up of Judah and uh, Benjamin and the half tribe of Manasseh. And this particular thing all occurred at the split of the children of Israel after the reign of King Solomon. And just to go back to bring, up, bring us up to date, Saul was the first king of Israel the people wanted a king because they wanted to be like the other people in the neighboring nations around them. And as a result of that, Saul uh, served as king for a period of 40 years. He began, became a little um, bullheaded and stubborn, disobeying the instructions that God was sending him through the prophet Samuel. And as a result of this, God had Samuel anoint another king who was called David. And at that particular time, David was uh, just a lad, a teenager. Uh, he was gaining notoriety in many aspects simply because he was being used by God. Well, David comes on, uh, he is anointed while Saul is king, and he serves 40 years as well. And at the death of David, then his son Solomon came on the reign, uh, to reign as king. And of course, Solomon did not have the problem that David had. David was busy fighting the Philistines and many of the other 
uh, nations around about them during the time he was king. And near the end of his period of kingship, or his reign, he decides he wants to build God a temple because he had already erected a palatial place for himself to live. And he felt that he'd been neglecting God, but God denied that privilege to David simply because he said to him, you have blood on your hand. And he said, the temple will be built by your son Solomon. And miraculously, or by the power of God, during the time that Solomon reigned, he did not encounter battlefield type activities. He had prayed to God when he was first anointed king that God would give him wisdom to rule the people. God blessed him with wisdom, and as we know, this man Solomon was classified as the wisest man that lived on the face of the earth, excluding Jesus Christ. Well, in this particular time, what has happened, the children of Israel were very strong-minded, uh, determined to do things their way. Uh, they got their way. God granted them the privilege of having a king because God's plan for them was that he would be their supreme being all the time. But they wanted to be like the other nations, and God repented in that regard. But after Solomon dies, then the kingdom became split. And we have, this is what we have today. And this particular setting of the scripture coming to us out of Ezekiel 37 starts off with this valley of dry bones. And Ezekiel is among these bones and he hears the clatter. God tells him uh, to speak to the bones. Uh, or he first asks him, will these bones live? And Ezekiel says, uh, you God, you know, uh, I don't know. So God tells him to pray to the bones. And then after he prays, he prophesies to, the, he prays to God and prophesies that the bones will come together. And they started cracking together and the bones got together in the valley and then there was ligaments and tendons that joined these elements and then skin grew on top of them but they were just there like a mannequin in the window and the show places downtown and then God says to Ezekiel prophesy uh, and the wind the breath of life joined them uh, they were than living bodies. And uh, they were to move out to understand and realize that the message God has given the people is that he has not forgotten them, even though they have been disobedient. The northern tribe has been captured by the Assyrians, and it was some hundred, a little over a hundred years later, the southern tribe was also captured by the Babylonians. So the text that we have in front of us today for studying the book of Ezekiel, chapter 37, bears out two different, uh, what we call, metaphors. And a metaphor really is what we, we, I think, in most cases, a lot of the theologians use today as a word picture. This is a story that is analyzed and presented <clears throat> in a fashion that is in a different group of word settings that would give you the picture of the facts, not quoting the specifics as they occurred at the time of the event that's being spoken of. So here we are at the time that God tells uh, uh, Ezekiel to prophesy to the bones and that has taken place. But the text that we have today covers the second metaphor and that has to do with a second way of God showing the people that he has not forgotten them, that he will rescue them from their calamities even though they've been disobedient. And this particular phase or the metaphor that's presented in the lesson that we, we're looking at today is probably not as familiar as the dry bones in the valley, but it has to do with the, the stick or, or, of wood that God tells Ezekiel to pick up and to write the name on. Uh, and, it, and after he writes the name of, of uh, the leader of the northern tribe, he used to pick up another stick and write the name of Judah, which is the southern tribe, and they, then he tells them to join these sticks. And this is to indicate that God is saying that even though you've been disobedient to me, even though you've uh, gone your way and you've done things your way, I still love you and I'm going to provide for you, I'm going to rescue you, even though you've been scattered, 
you've done things that are displeasing and disobedient, I'm going to bring you together. So when he joined these six together, this is to indicate another, this is the other metaphor that we're talking about, or a word picture that shows us exactly what God's plan is and how he proposes to rescue his people, even though they've been disobedient. So the text that we deal with on this Sunday in the Sunday School lesson begins with the 21st verse of the 37th chapter of Ezekiel. And it reads thusly, And say unto them, Thus said the Lord God, Behold, I will take the children of Israel from among the heathen, whither they be gone, and will gather them on every side, and bring them into their own land. Now this message is something that indicates to them that wherever they are and wherever they've been, it, uh, God has not forgotten them, and he wants them to understand and realize it, to realize that his love is present for them. And wherever you've been, he says, I'm still your God, and I want to be your God forever. And if, if you stop disobeying me, things will be different. Now, the southern tribe, as we know, was captured by Nebuchadnezzar in, uh, from, in Babylon. So they had been taken there for some 70 years. And what happened to the people, like the people of today, we get complacent in our surroundings, especially if we have an opportunity to flex our muscles, to explore thoughts and attitudes that we have that give us an opportunity to mature in a way that is similar to those that are around us. And even though God has given the permission to the children of Israel through the King Cyrus to go back and rebuild the temple and the wall around Jerusalem, some of the people were so complacent to a point where they stayed in Babylon because they became Chaldeanized. In other words, they adopted the principles and the activities and the actions of the Chaldeans, and they were happy in doing that. And even though they were permitted to go back and build the wall, to build, rebuild the temple first and then to build the wall, some of them stayed there simply because they were complacent with the surroundings of the people in their area. But as God had presented this metaphor that we spoke of, of having him put those sticks together, this was to show the people that he still loved them and he wanted to join them together and to serve them in total as a unit, not in split uh, divisions as they're in. The problem here uh, is one that uh, the prophet has to get the message over to them so that they'll realize that God wants to present himself to them and to be their leader and uh, that he will provide for them a king for leadership, which is the person in the talking of this particular lesson, David, who was the king. And the reference in some cases is that it, they refer to David not as, as he was still the king, but the pattern of life and the pattern of rulership that David exercised at the time he was king was one that was the, the model or the standard bearer for the procedure. Uh, so we know that what is going on, these tribes, let me see if I can, the tribes of Israel numbered 12, and these were the 12 sons of Jacob. But the 12 tribes were not allocated property and land in the promised land as the children were named that were fathered by Jacob. And what we have is the, tri the tribe, uh, well, there's no, tri the tribe of Levi was the religious tribe of the ones that took care of the temple, so there was no land allocation. The other individuals, like in our church settings today, were taken care of by the contributions that were presented to the church treasury, and as a result, they were cared for by the contributions from the other uh, 11 tribes. Then what happened, as you know and remember, when Joseph was sold into Egypt as a slave, sold to Potiphar, who was a commander of the guard of the Pharaoh, in Egypt, he went through a situation where Potiphar's wife was physically attracted to him, and as a result of his denying her 
uh, the physical contact that she wanted by inviting him to her bed. He was accused of, of, of violating her, and as a result of that, Joseph gets thrown into prison. But God was constantly with Joseph, and as a result of this, he blessed him where he was. Before Potiphar's wife accused him of violating her, uh, Potiphar had given him charge of his house. Everything that was in there uh, was under his control except Potiphar's wife. But when she could not convince him to, get, to go to bed with her, she wound up telling a, a lie on him and uh, tried to pull him into a room and he ran out and left his coat. So what the Bible tells us to flee youthful lust and jo Joseph was a man, a young man, a handsome young man that lived up to those principles. What has been a mystery to me down through the years when I've read these stories about Joseph is where Joseph got all of these very devout practices and following Jesus because he, his father, Jacob, wasn't really living that kind of a life. I, I suppose we can say that Joseph received these messages from God Almighty and he applied them to his life. And uh, he was being used by God because he was preparing him for work that was ahead. So what happens with Joseph is that he is in prison because Potiphar's wife accused him of violating her. And it was the only thing was that he refused to in, in involve himself with her physically. But after he finally uh, is called out of prison and interprets the Pharaoh's dream, he was appointed to and given the position <coughs> excuse me, of second in command in the whole land of Egypt. And as a result of that, the king gave him a wife, and she bare him two sons. One was named Ephraim, and the other one Manasseh. And I'm telling that part of the story in order to, in, to show you why the tribes of Israel were not named, but there wasn't one by the name of Joseph, there wasn't one that had land in, in the promised land. There wasn't one under the title Levi, because that's the priestly tribe. So to replace the priestly tribe of Levi and, uh, and the, the position under the name of Joseph, Joseph's two sons carried those positions. So Ephraim is one of the tribes that's listed. And then his, his brother, the other son of Joseph, named Manasseh, fills that other slot. So that's why when you read the other passages of scripture, you see the name of Ephraim and you see the name of Manasseh as a tribe, but those were not, those were grandsons to Jacob, but they had a position because the tribe of Levi's position was moved so they could cover as a priestly tribe. And then Joseph was not, he had he fathered those two boys and he's represented through their love. And this is what's going on with those two sticks that God has Ezekiel to join together. One had the name of Ephraim on it, and the other one for the southern tribe of Judah. And God is bringing back these two fractions or divisions of the children of Israel, and he's saying to you, no more will you be divided. No more will you be separated to a point where you are identified individually, but through the joining together of these sticks under that metaphor, Unity is back in the picture. So that's the story that we are dealing with in the text of the Sunday school lesson for this coming Sunday. So it says to us there in that 21st verse, it thus said the Lord, Behold, I will take the children of Israel from among the heathens, whether they be gone, wherever they might have gone, and will gather them on every side and bring them into their own land. Verse 22 says, And I will make them one nation in the land upon the mountain of Israel, and one king shall be king to them all, and they shall be no more two nations. Neither shall they be divided into two kingdoms any more at all. And that represents what I was trying to explain earlier about the tribes and, the, uh, and where they got the titles and the name. What is very worth mentioning and remembering 
is that even though the children of Israel during the time or before this particular presentation and uh, prophecy was made by Ezekiel, they had served idol gods in these different lands. But after the captivity in Babylon, the scriptures indicate to us that no longer did they have a problem with serving idol gods. I'm not saying that the children of Israel didn't commit any more sins and they did not defy God's instruction, but they didn't worship these idols like they had in the past. They at least learned that from their incarceration, if you call it that, being in Babylon uh, for that period of time of, of 70 years, the mandatory time. Verse 23 says, Neither shall they defile themselves anymore with their idols, which, which is what I was just speaking of, nor with their detestable things. And that's just another phrase to indicate objects and symbols and items that persons might look up to and use as something to give praise and worship. The scripture here in the Ezekiel gives us the message and he calls some of those detestable things. Anything that interferes with the attention and the focus that we have in the form of honor that goes to anyone other than God Almighty, it is a detestable thing or it is an idol. For if you remember in Exodus 20, God said, Thou shalt not have any uh, gods other than me. And so he, this is something that they got away from, but they still committed other atrocities and things that were not, com not completely in compliance with God's rule. Well, neither shall they defile themselves anymore with their idols, in verse 23, nor with their detestable things, nor with any of their transgressions, but I will save them out of all their dwelling places, wherein they have sinned, and will cleanse them, so shall they be my people, and I will be their God. What more could you ask that the, the, the creator, the, the maker of all things on the earth, has promised to be our God? Why should we uh, defy him or look to idols or detestable things to give our praise and worship to? Well, verse 24 says, <clears throat> And David, my servant, shall be king over them, and they all shall have, have one shepherd. They shall also walk in my judgments and observe my statutes and do them. And as I said a moment ago, it's not that David is the king forever, because everyone that sits in a position of leadership as a king or president or CEO has a time frame that they will come down off the mountain as leader and someone else will evolve. You see the same thing happening in the New Testament. Basically during the time when uh, Christ was dealing with and uh, his ministry on the earth, the disciples that followed them around, there was three in the inner circle, Peter, James, and John. And Peter was usually the spokesman. He was the one that was in the leadership role. But then after Christ had ascended, the leadership role changed somewhat because Peter was in the field in evangelistic movements and John became the one that was the leader of the disciples. And that I believe is this, the exact reason why King Herod killed James by the sword prior to him planning to kill Peter because he, James was the one that was the leader. If there is a snake in your house, you don't cut his tail off to get rid of him, you want to be, you behead him. So King Herod <clears throat> killed James by the sword when just before that, before the ascension of Christ, Peter was the leader. And if he had been in that same position, then he probably would have been the one that lost his head. God had, so the person that's on top of the, the leadership position or in, in charge, it, your time always Somebody needs to tell 45 that uh, he can't sit on the throne forever. Somebody, it's a time and you come out, even when you get there by hook or crook, it won't last forever, 45. But anyway, James is killed by the sword in the New Testament. And then King Herod arrests Peter because the people praised him for the Jewish people, because they weren't accepting Christ. 
it's being the son of God. So here we are with, with him, Peter, I mean, the King Herod thinking that he's, he's doing something good or he gets a good report that's sent to Caesar because he destroyed or killed James. And it, because it gave him some accolade and some notoriety that was pushing him up the ladder, he rests Peter later and he was going to do the same thing because, uh, you know, what we like uh, to repeat when we get, when somebody pats us on the back, on the right side, we like to turn the other side of them, pat us on that side. This is what Herod was doing. But anyway, back to the to this text. The problem, or what the point we want to make is that you don't stay on the throne in leadership roles forever. And this is exactly what was going on here. And he says that, that David was a king, even though David may have been dead at that time, the idea that's being presented in this, this passage of, of scripture is that if a person practiced his kingship duties and lived according to the instruction that God had instructed, had given them, which they would call it a, a role compared to what David was doing. So even though David was dead, if you performed and served as a king in the spirit of love, like God said David was a man after his own heart, then you were doing what God wanted you to do. And as a result of that, they call that David kind of leadership and role. And that's what that means. Not that David was still on the throne at this time because he was long dead. So uh, yeah, again to read verse 34. And David my servant shall be king over them and they shall have him uh, one shepherd. They shall also walk in my judgments and observe my statutes and do them. Then verse 25 says that in they shall dwell in the land that I have given unto Jacob my servant, wherein your fathers have dwelt, and they shall dwell therein, even they and their children and their children's children forever, and my servant David shall be their prince forever. And remember to put that under the message I was trying to give, that if you're doing the rulership activities and duties like David did them, you, it's, it, they consider that to be in his reign or his type of reign and leadership. Then verse 30 to 26 says to us, Moreover, I will make a covenant of peace with them, and it shall be an everlasting covenant with them. And I will place them and multiply them, and will set my sanctuary in the midst of them forevermore. He wants, to, wants them to understand that I will not desert you. I'm bringing you back together because that's what I want is unity of all of the 12 tribes. And this message that they are to carry on to pass to the rest of the world, to the balance of the Jewish community, to the Gentile world, is that God is the creator, the leader, uh, the director of all the activities. And, and there will be no one that will take his place. But forevermore, he says, <clears throat> you follow the pattern that David followed, and that was a man who practiced uh, after, as a man after God's own heart. So in verse 27, he says, and my tabernacle also shall be with them. Yea, I will be their God, and they shall be my people. In that case, they're not talking about the building or the tent that they worship God in. But he is saying that my tabernacle shall be with them. He's indicating that my presence, my, my spirit, my, my love for you and my continued support for you will be, shall be with them forever. Not that uh, the building or the tent that they were in, which is what the, the temporary place of worship, but it's the presence of God as he is, will forever be with them as he's indicating in verse 27. And then the last verse, verse 28, And the heathen shall know that I, the Lord, do sanctify Israel, when my sanctuary shall be in the midst of them forevermore. God's presence has not departed any of us. We have shut him out. We've ostracized uh, the program in that regard in many cases. We've set ourselves on pedestals. We've done like the Hebrew children. We choose to follow the patterns of the world 
which means that we have shut God out. It's not that his presence, his tabernacling with us has changed, but he's constantly there to provide for us whatever we need, and he will do it more vigorously if we are obedient, because we, we won't have the interruptions of being taken away in bondage like the northern tribes by the Chaldeans or the southern tribe by the uh, northern tribe by the Assyrians rather, the southern tribe by the Chaldeans or the country of Babylonia. So the message that we have to us under this text title to that Sunday is God's servant king. It means that God who is in charge, who is a creator, wants us to follow the pattern of life that he has set aside. And David was a man who practiced that type of living. So he served the people and that was the kingship role that he had been given. And we are to maintain that because God says when we are obedient, he will never depart from us. He will he'll take care of everything that's necessary in order that we might grow and prosper and be in good health and enjoy the blessings that he has for us. And we must not follow idols and those uh, uh, detestable things that the Hebrew children were following before they were convinced that that was not the way God wanted them to live. And that is a lesson that we will be studying in detail, more detail Sunday, under the title of God's Servant King, out of Ezekiel chapter 37. And we trust that uh, it will help you to prepare for that in your study for Sunday morning, Sunday school class. God bless. Okay. <laughs> Just a little talk with Jesus makes it 
Now let us have a little talk with Jesus. We will tell him all about our troubles. He will hear our faintest cry. And he will answer by and by. Now when you feel a little prayer will turn in. And you know a little fire is burning. We will have a little talk. It's all right. 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 Just a little talk with Jesus makes it right. It's all 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 right. Just a little talk with Jesus makes it This brings to a close our midweek Bible study here at First Virginia Avenue Missionary Baptist Church. We are thankful for each and every one of you that joined us during this time of study and fellowship. On behalf of Pastor Duncan, we praise God and thank God for all of you and all the participation. Thank Brother Lipscomb, Maestro Louis Lipscomb, and leadership of the music, and for this praise team of all male characters for this evening Amen. and for Deacon Burns uh, for scripture and prayer and then in the media room we have Jimmy Wright and, and Deacon Alex Davis Amen. getting everything presented and prepared for broadcast Amen. and we're delighted that you've joined us and I trust that some explanation uh, concerning the lesson might help in your study because this is a culmination of several matters uh, leading up to this particular lesson. And much more time would be necessary to do it justice, but trusting that this opened the door for an understanding we have for the lesson that we'll be studying out of Ezekiel 37 for this coming Sunday. We would like to invite any and all of you to join us on Sunday morning at 9.30 for Sunday school, followed by our morning services that begin at 11 a.m. Pastor Duncan should be in the pulpit, and we trust that you will join us. We have classes in Sunday school for all ages, and we invite you and welcome each and every one of you to join us, and then stay for our morning service, and we are sure that you'll be blessed with the worship, that, the worship experience that is presented here at First Virginia Avenue Baptist Church. Thanks for joining us, and let's go to God in a prayer for our benediction. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for this day. Thank you for your presence in our lives and for your guidance and direction that you provide for us daily and for the courage that we have to step out on your word. And help us, Father, to understand and receive the messages that you have for us in your word and in the book of Ezekiel, to understand and realize that you are desirous that we be in unity with one another, for your power, your message of love is multiplied when we are in communion with you. We thank you for all that you do and ask that you forgive us of our sins, guide and direct us as we depart from this place, grant traveling grace to our places of residency, bring us back at the next appointed time to continue on in worship and praise and service to you. And now may the grace of God, the love of Jesus, the communion of the Holy Spirit rest, rule and abide with each of us from now until eternity. And we'll all sing. Let the church say amen. Let the church say amen. God has spoken. Let the church say
God has spoken. Let the church say. God bless.